everybody. How's it going? Are you doing good? Woo! Such a quiet audience. Yes. All right. I'm so glad to be back. It's been a long time since I've been here. I was at the. I'm, I become one of these people who says I was the very first. When I was. I was here 20 years ago. It's been a long time. In fact, it's been 15 years since uh, I, I wrote and published this book, Persuasive Games, uh, which was about how computer games uh, and simulations make arguments and how they express ideas. And, and even worse, uh, the game studio that I founded to make those kinds of games uh, for politics and business and education and other domains, which is also called Persuasive Games, it's now 20 years old, which means that I am older than 20 years old. Uh, now, these were never just my ideas. I drew on a lot of precedents that were ancient by the time I got to them. Clark Apt's work on non-digital serious games in the, in the 1970s, the long tradition of educational games, starting with uh, Plato in the 1960s, continuing through the edutainment trends of the 80s. We had the work of the Serious Games Initiative, which sort of updated that phrase for digital games starting in the late 90s. Uh, designers like Chris Crawford were making commercial uh, political games two decades uh, before me. There was a lot of stuff, but I had my version of it, and my version went like this. Games and simulations are these systems of interlocking parts and behaviors, and the world is also made of interlocking parts and behaviors, of, of complex systems, as we sometimes call them. And I was intrigued that that was like a parallel structure. And that parallel structure, to me, seemed to give games a unique ability to represent how things work in the world, or how they should work, which is just to say that games could, like, you could use a game to make an argument about which approaches to managing complex systems would be more or less desirable. And that approach to making arguments seemed to me different enough from other forms of rhetoric, like verbal or visual and you know, those other kinds of, of, of argumentation that I suggested a whole new category for it, which I called procedural rhetoric. And that, that idea was like it's rhetoric, it's an argument made from a model that you interact with. And that idea has enjoyed some substantial influence. Like people read the book, and, and to some extent, you get in early on the ground floor of a field, you know, the people kind of have to read you if they want to pursue uh, the, the canon of the, of the field. And you know, as a design philosophy for the, for the studio, it produced you know, a lot of games, some of which I'm, I'm quite proud of, some of which were weird and interesting. We did get, you know, the first official US presidential game. We did uh, games about airport security and consumer debt and disaffected workers in the petroleum industry and suburban errands and green building design. And we did a game about pandemic flu back a while ago, a lot of good that did. Um, and a lot of people played these games uh, at the time. They, they look so, somewhat modest by today's standards, but we, you know, we got them out there so that uh, ordinary folks could play them on their, uh, on their web browsers and their phones. Uh, they got uh, collected and exhibited uh, internationally. I, I, I got to be on the Colbert Report. I got lots uh, of attention. Uh, for this work. Uh, but looking back on it, if I'm being honest, I have to admit that it hasn't necessarily changed much. Um, certainly not as much as I'd hoped in that period of time in the late 90s and early 2000s when uh, I started. And that's sort of the, the sentiment I want to walk through uh, a little bit today. So OK, I had this idea that almost everything in the world involves some kind of systemic behaviors. And those systemic behaviors couldn't be effectively or fully explained with simple declarative statements. And to me, that applied not just to the big things like climate change and economic inequality or global health, or the, certainly it did apply to those things, but not exclusively. Ordinary things like you know, mowing your lawn or working your minimum wage job, those were also a complex systems. And if we could sort of just insinuate games into everything, then I hope that they would help people in any, con in any context uh, understand the world in more complex terms as these, these systems that involved uh, trade-offs and compromises. Now, this was actually kind of a long time ago. Um, this was before Facebook existed. This was before the iPhone. This was before YouTube. Uh, blogs were the thing that people were excited about uh, back then. Google hadn't gone public. And so the idea of games potential to become a, a powerful and maybe even a universal medium for procedural argument, that seemed possible in a different way than it does today. And it seemed so possible to me back in those days in 2003, 2004, um, that I started making these kind of preposterous 
prognostications uh, about it. Back during the 2004 election cycle, when I was working on a bunch of these games and getting a bunch of attention for them, I said to some reporter somewhere, I was like, you know, by the next election cycle, 2008, every candidate for major office is going to have like their own PlayStation video game, you know, which would like be the like the simulated world that outlined their policy. This is like their platform. This is what it's like to live in that candidate's idea of, of America or wherever the election was taking place. And um, uh, instead, uh, you you may recall that we didn't get that. We 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 got we got YouTube. There was video-based campaigning it was really heavy duty in 2008, and then and then we got Facebook and and data-based uh, campaigning, and by by 2016, that data took weaponized form, and you kind of know uh, the rest of the story. So I couldn't have been uh, more wrong in thinking that debates fueled by procedural rhetoric would emerge as a new standard in political discourse, or, or even like a thing, let alone a new standard. And, and some of my friends, uh, yeah, there's the, the, the some of my friends were, were similarly wrong. Uh, uh, the game designer Eric Zimmerman also been at this event many times, writing with uh, Heather Chaplin, a, a journalist, uh, imagined a, uh, a ludic century uh, a number of years back, and the idea was that like playful sophistication would make prior forms of communication outmoded, and we would enter this new age of complex thinking, and games would be the native forum for it. Uh, but uh, once again, instead, we ended up with simpler and simpler discourse built around shorter and more impatient uh, sound bites. Some of you may be trying to capture some sound bites of what I'm saying right now to send off into that media ecosystem. And television condensed itself into online video and, and then into vines and TikToks and discourse kind of metastasized into the chaos of comment sections and the hellscape of Twitter arguments. And that situation is uh, not just persistent, but it seems to be getting ever worse. And it's completely unclear how we might change it uh, or turn around. So I've been thinking about this for a while, and the signs were, were there early. Even a, about a decade or more ago, I started to realize that this future that I'd imagined would probably not come to pass. And part of that realization came from work that I was doing in, in news games, like a category of this effort. And I've been doing some work with the New York Times next door that completely failed uh, for reasons that are in the book. Uh, and we had some support from the Knight Foundation to research the potential for this idea, which turned into the, to the book. I wrote it with a couple of my students. And one lesson that we discussed in this book was that you can't just kind of have like one-offs. You, 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 you know, you have to scale this sort of thing up. You, you can't invent television news broadcasts by trying one or two out and seeing how it goes and then kind of like getting together with your friends and looking at the TV news show you made and going, wow, this might really be something. Like you have to build an entire social practice cultured around this form that involves uh, mass habits of time and attention. And that, that very same thing was true for games and remains true for them. But you also can't like will that into existence. You can't just kind of, oh, would that it happen? Um, and you can't do it just by making a few games uh, every year or sort of identifying a few games that are successful as somehow corresponding with those goals. The whole rest of the media environment would have to support this effort. And that support, I think, requires massive systemic change in the media ecosystem. It, it might even require, I don't know how you do this, but it might require somehow the decline of the media formats of the 20th century uh, in order for this sort of systems-driven procedural uh, uh, literacy and rhetoric to have any hope of, of taking its place. And that's kind of a whole other talk but I'll just say that that didn't happen. Instead, we got smartphones that, that filled up with words and images and moving images and audio. And the revolution of systems thinking, whether it was my version of it or others, never really came to pass. And it's hard for me to look at the world today and think that it's poised to do so anytime soon. We got kind of new authoring systems and new distribution channels with computers rather than using computers for uh, a new kind of representation. So I've, like, I've tried to go back and think about this, you know, like what happened. And uh, I realized that Persuasive Games was a, a future forecast uh, in part. Like I, I was imagining an experience that wasn't yet present or possible that might be lurking uh, around the corner. But I didn't fully realize that that's what I was doing. I thought I was just making the future. 
uh, not building a scaffolding from which uh, it would still have to be built. Uh, and I thought about others who were uh, active at, at this time, one of, one of whom is James Paul G. Uh, and by 2003, when I was just getting started with this, when this event was starting, uh, he published this book called What Video Games Have to Teach Us About Learning and Literacy. And he's a wise guy, and by this time, G had already been through two whole different careers, one in linguistics and another in, in literacy. And he was like quite well known in these domains and then started to slum it with us in video games. And the position he presented in this book, uh, if you go back and read it, if you haven't read it, if you read it for the first time, was all about the potential of games as literacy tools or as models for learning. He never ever presented learning games as a goal that was realized or even a goal to be realized. Instead, he looked at these kind of interesting examples that to him as a literacy scholar, especially in commercial games, Ninja Gaiden and others, they, they provided evidence for the premise that good games teach things better than other kinds of learning experiences too, do. But unfortunately, uh, then as now, uh, what they taught for G was mostly just how to play the game. They were really effective at that. And they could do more than that, he thought. But that possibility uh, wasn't guaranteed. And, it, and it, kind of, it kind of still isn't. And it's sort of ironic to me that the, the components um, that made social media, which I, I sort of consider uh, my enemy now, so popular, that those drove actually so much of the interest uh, in, in my work, you know? That, that kind of like emotion and novelty was what was at issue, not necessarily the, the systemic arguments I thought I was trying to start making with these games. Um, the idea of the promise instead, like, hey, here's a game about educational funding or a game about contagious disease. And you get these headlines, which you still kind of get, which is like, it's not just fun and games anymore or whatever. And in that environment, you know, we, we come on these stages like this and we talk about how games are bigger than they ever have. And it's true, but still, we're still in an environment where games are functioning on this kind of rhetorical register. But instead of the one that I imagined, this sort of sophisticated engagement with, with uh, uh, with complex systems, it's, it's, it's the level of their impression, of their concept, how delightful and surprising it is that there might be a game like this. Uh, and I kind of worry that, um, I don't know, that we, if we're being honest with ourselves, that, we, that it's, it's really hard to move beyond that, but also that we haven't fully succeeded. And I was looking at the program and the games uh, for this year's event, and it's all super interesting. There's a lot of stuff. You know, there's XR design, there's blockchain, NFTs, metaverse, representation in games, uh, cultural preservation. Um, it's all great. But I would also just observe that it's, it's a little hard to map. It's a little hard to explain to people beyond these walls what it all means and what it adds up to. Like, if, if this is a community, then what does it share in common, does it share anything in common? Uh, what, are, what are the goals uh, that we have together and how would we know uh, if we'd reached them? And the, and the website, not to pick on it, but you know, the website says that game changers have in common that we want to make an impact through video games or immersive media. And um, I don't know, I don't know that people I talk to in, in the rest of my life would understand that. Like doesn't everyone want to make an impact? Didn't, didn't Facebook make an impact? Or if, if it's enough to be you know, kind of vaguely pro-social and also be a game maker, not just be like a total sociopath, but also be making video games, then I don't know, I don't know that that's an amb ambitious uh, enough, enough goal, spoken from somebody who's had failed uh, a ambitious goals. So like I, this is kind of a, like a shitty position to advance uh, in, in, this, in this venue, uh, and I realized that, and I actually know it from experience, because many years ago, um, during the height of the early success of persuasive games, I saw uh, the writer Steven Johnson speak at this, this very conference, uh, Games for Change, and he'd just published uh, uh, this book, Everything Bad is Good for You, which argued that games and other somewhat reviled popular media, television, and so on, uh, were unexpectedly adept at making people smarter. And during his talk, Johnson did kind of what I'm doing, you know, sort of like, I don't know. And, and he noted that he'd seen my name and my stuff, the persuasive game stuff. And he said, you know, I just don't think games could ever really be an effective persuasive medium. Like, you know, not nearly as effective as language. Um, you know, and text is sort of the bread and butter of his, his career as a, as a writer. 
and I was sitting where you're sitting, or, or you know, and, and I was just kind of like pissed off at the time. I remember like, you know, look, we're just getting started, you know, and he, he was already trying to dismiss this potential as, as kind of unimaginative in his naysaying way. Um, but since then, and I've become friends with Johnson since too, and we've talked about this, and I, you know, I've had to admit that he, that he had a point. In, in fact, today, right now, this year, I spend much more of my time writing words about the world than I do making games that try to depict its operation. So much so uh, that the games world may kind of be at risk of, of, of forgetting uh, about me. I, in the run up to, the, to this conference, in the couple weeks before the event, I received these emails from, from Games for Change's PR firm that got sent to my Atlantic email address. And the emails were meant to, to make you aware, if you weren't already, of Games for Change, a nonprofit focused on driving real change uh, using games and technology. And I was just like, wow, I see, I see where I'm at here. And I'm, I'm not complaining. I just want to show you how this played out for me, that my social impact as a writer and a journalist is probably greater than my impact ever was uh, as a game designer, even if being a game designer and a theorist was, was extremely good for my career. So, have I given up on, on games for change or persuasive games or whatever you want to call them? Not, not at all. Um, but in some ways, the, the next generation of this work, whatever it is, in theory and in practice, probably ought to come from, from different voices. And it would be OK with me if I sort of you know, vanish into history, if history uh, will have me. But for now, I just want to suggest to you a kind of stark realism that you might want to adopt if you haven't been doing this for 20 years uh, like I have or more, like others have, um, or that might not occur to you if you spend most of your time looking forward as folks like us tend to do rather than looking back. Uh, so like, like it or not, serious games, persuasive games, educational games, games for change, whatever you want to call them, they still remain an aspirational media form, a, a form with potential like Jim G would say of games and learning, a potential that is yet to be realized and a potential whose realization is not guaranteed. And I do kind of worry of a asking for impact, you know, where, 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 you know, kind of change is a bare word. Sometimes I think about how like a while back it became a sort of tech industry cliche to talk about changing the world, you know, and everything like your app or the, like lets you order pet food or whatever. Um, like that became somehow implicated in the process of world changing and it became so widespread and so comical that it got this, you may remember, got this send up on the HBO series Silicon Valley. There was this fake conference and you had these sort of inept entrepreneurs mumbling about their inscrutable products and then announcing in the end that it was going to change the world. And of course for them changing the world meant getting rich because what else could it mean? So that aspiration uh, is kind of a marketing hook, you know? It's not, a, it's not necessarily a goal, but it has bled into every aspect of contemporary life now that computers and smartphones and apps uh, pervade that life. And games got lured uh, into it too. I've, I've been worried about this for years. I remember like I, I went back through my files and e even in 2012, which is a decade ago, I was pulling out these same kind of articles, you know, can games change the world, this kind of notions. And what bothered me about that then as much as now is that it was always the opposite of what I found promising about games. That that idea that changing the world is this sort of simple principle, that was incompatible with the premise that I had always been trying to advance, namely that games have a unique power to reject simplicity and to demonstrate complexity and help people mistrust singular answers. OK, I want to end with, with two thoughts. Um, and the first is, is I want to hear myself say in this context as much as I want you to hear it, uh, which is that the promise of these kinds of games, at least to me, uh, was that it wouldn't shy away. This design practice, this cultural practice, wouldn't shy away from the messy and true nature of difficult and intractable things, whether those were social situations or whether it was just like me trying to be honest with you about my career and how it's gone. And I think that that puzzle of being frank and sincere about uh, complex systems remains unsolved. And games could become widespread tools uh, for complex discourse, that kind of discourse some of us foresaw. But to do so, they'd have to somehow alter the media circumstances that resist and even destroy 
complex thinking. And I, I don't know what to say about that. I don't know how to solve that problem, but I, I hope you'll consider it. You'll just like let that bat, bat itself around in your head and maybe you can work on it. And that leads me to the second thought, which is a, a, a maybe more of a reflection that, than anything, which is that you know, as I try to look back and, and do a little self-critique, uh, I also risk forgetting where the bar was set all those years ago uh, for topics unfamiliar to games, you know, statements of policy, appeals to health, playable education, all of this sort of stuff. Uh, I was at the first uh, uh, to this rodeo. Uh, we had, as I said at the start, you know, Infocom text adventures that dealt with issues and themes of human regret and loss and edutainment titles that had become cultural icons and political strategy games that the New York Times discussed long, long, long before I got started or this event did. But at the, at the start of the, the new millennium, uh, when I began, those games had mostly been uh, forgotten, really, except as specimens from a kind of alternate timeline. And for uh, those of us who were there at the time, um, maybe the work that we did in that moment was more about kind of watering those new buds at a moment when they, when they craved it and when they had the potential to bloom a little and lead to the next thing. And that might be, that might be enough. The future, it seems to me, is maybe right now, like this week even, more open than it has been in a, a long time. Facebook, which is uh, a terrible blight on humankind made from the opposite of games, yeah. might, yeah, go ahead, yeah, come on. <laughs> Facebook has the real potential of destroying itself by investing in the metaverse, a domain derived from games. So that's an interesting opportunity. Apple, I don't know who the sponsors are, I didn't read the sign, so. <laughs> uh, Apple, which is a company that's kind of always hated games, has waged a war for privacy that's hampering the attention economy in a, in a, real, in a real way, and, and that's uh, another interesting opportunity. There is a forthcoming and likely horrific uh, global recession uh, ahead of us that might crush some bad actors and bad ideas and uh, make new opportunities available. And if we make it through it, maybe we can take advantage of some of those. So I hope you keep your eyes peeled, especially while you still have the energy and vigor to act on those ideas, because you do get tired uh, doing this work. Um, but look, games, they're just not an obvious victor in the battle uh, for the public good. In, in two decades, I hope I can sit where you are and watch you share your victories in having changed how people understand the world differently and better through games uh, and playable media. I really do. Uh, but to get there, I don't think it's going to be enough just to make some clever games. You're going to have to change the way people consume ideas too, which is a harder problem. But it's also one that I, I trust to the games community more than anybody else. Thank you so much for your attention. Today.